Yeah, I wanted to kick the hornet's nest right now, actually, um, in my field. Um, and I may, I may regret this, but the question <laughs> of- I may, I'm sitting next uh, to you. Don't worry, it's not being recorded. <laughs> the question of self-censorship is very much alive in China studies today. Um, and uh, among practitioners uh, outside of China. Um, it, we live in an interesting moment where, uh, as you're all aware, there's sort of the rise of illiberalism around the world and the kind of consolidated democratic gains that people thought had been made since the Berlin Wall came down are now starting to fracture. Um, and in the case of China in particular, you have a sort of resurgent authoritarian tendency um, with profound economic market power. And China is able to flex this economic muscle around the world to assert its influence in ways that are legitimate and potentially more problematic. Um, and so one of the ways that China is doing this, as I'm sure you're aware, is uh, well, think of the enormous Chinese market that Google has uh, several years ago decided not to participate in, but is now reevaluating its decision by contemplating having a censored search engine, a censored version of Google that will operate within China. Um, and this is simply because Google is responsive to the demands of its shareholders and it wants a larger market. It needs economic growth. And the China market is almost too big to pass up. It's tempting, but they have to play by China rules. Similarly, China exerted its market power to get major international airlines and hotel chains to erase the word Taiwan from their literature and from their websites because of course Taiwan is not an independent entity from the PRC government's point of view, it's an inalienable part of China. Um, this applies in the information space and in the university space too in subtle ways. I mean, some of you may have heard um, that the scholars of China who write works that are critical of certain practices in China, a very small number of them have encountered visa difficulties. Um, it's not possible for them to return to China. And for many scholars, this is a professional kiss of death. If you're tenured already, then you can survive, but if you're not tenured, then it impacts your research and your ability to move ahead in your field. Uh, and so this is extremely punitive and it has real consequences. Now this has only happened in a tiny number of cases, but the fact that it has happened leads people to think, well, gee, what are the standards? There's an ambiguity, a sense that this could potentially happen to me and it could be ruinous. And everybody navigates those sets of concerns in their own way. Um, some people, it never comes up. If you're working on a piece of 18th century fiction, the political ramifications of it are probably quite limited. But if you're working on LGBT rights in contemporary China, that's maybe extremely political. Uh, and so there might be ways in which you choose not to engage with that topic if, if you're concerned about whether you'd be able to return to China. Like I say, people sort of navigate this in their own way. It's the, it's the, there are no clear guidelines and you don't know where the red lines are and that's deliberate because what it does is it puts the onus on you and it makes you kind of second guess your own inclinations. And so you'll, some people may choose not to say things that they otherwise would say. Another consequence of this is that your informants that you use for your research in China could be compromised by things that you might say. And so simply to protect them you may choose to backpedal or soft pedal some arguments you might make because it might expose people that you care about who at some risk to themselves have shared information with you. And so this is a form of self-censorship, but it's a benign form of self-censorship because you might not be as forthright as you otherwise would have been if there were no human consequences for speaking you know, the way that you might first want to speak. Um, at the organizational level, China's market power is impacting American universities as well. Um, many of the cooperative arrangements that happen between American universities and Chinese universities are happening most smoothly in the space of STEM fields because those implicate politics less. Engineering, biomechanical stuff, computer science. Um, the social sciences tend to be less a part of that and in fact, American universities have um, in practice decided that social scientists are really messy and problematic to involve in the negotiations of this because we raise all of the problems in contemporary China. Whereas the STEM people are simply concerned with getting their basic computer science research done. And so it's much easier for them to collaborate with China in this space. And so what you see very often is the collaborations tend to flow in areas where everyone can cooperate and not make waves in the fields like, again, the social sciences and the humanities where we ask more critical questions. 
um, the cooperation is less so. And so this kind of shapes the field um, in subtle ways too. The sciences are privileged and the social sciences and humanities tend to not participate in this. Um, and then there's a, a, a final area in which sort of self-censorship occurs. Um, and that is uh, simply when you're choosing the topics to work on. Um, some topics because of the political regime in China and the information that's available to you are harder to research, harder to look into. So frequently, just to get your work done, you may choose the path of least resistance. You may choose topics that are easier to research. You may choose topics on which there's better data available, so you can simply do higher quality work. Um, this works to the Chinese government's advantage, too, by limiting, channeling you in some areas and away from others. And so it, it operates on multiple levels. Many individual scholars take umbrage at the idea that self-censorship is a concern because it implicates their own personal choices. And yet, it doesn't necessarily require kind of affirmative complicity in a regime of self-censorship to be affected by the censorship regime. 